be you, you know. Um, now's the time where we invite our children who are pre-K through fifth grade to head on off with Jeannie, that lady in the Christmas hat right there. Not to be confused with that guy in the Christmas hat back there. Uh, she can get you uh, squared away if you haven't had a chance to register your child. Um, she can get you all squared away with our, our registration and custodial care and all that stuff. And uh, as they're heading off, we will now turn our attention to... Have fun! Uh, we're going to turn our attention to the lighting of the second Advent candle, the candle of Bethlehem. Peace. But as we did at the Hemmeth Ratha, we will be too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain, because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. God comes unexpectedly when Israel was searching for a warrior to come in glory. Jesus came humbly to a tiny, insignificant town outside of Jerusalem. God's ways confound us and surprise us. We light this candle to remember that of all the ways God could have come to rescue his creation, he chose to come humbly. And with that, we're one Sunday closer to Christmas. At this time, I would like to invite the worship support team to come forward as we prepare to give our tithes and offering. I would like to remind you that if you've taken an opportunity to serve Jesus this week, uh, at least an hour this week, to place a salty service card, Melanie's got one here, um, and place it in your basket with your offering. You should find one in the, back, the seat back pocket in front of you. If not, raise your hand and one of the support team will provide you with one. Let us pray. O oh God of our salvation, we praise you, for you give us every good thing. You speak peace to our hearts. By, the, by your power, steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. May we live in gratitude for our reconciliation with you through Jesus Christ, your Son. Let us dedicate ourselves to your service in his name.
Christmas time of year, but I especially like that verse that is born that we no more have to die. Isn't that great? And I have to worry about that in Christ. Uh, that's just one of the perks of believing. And I'm thankful for that today. It's time to go to prayer, and I know that uh, this is a praying church. When you put your prayer request down on that card, the prayer request card, you can be sure that all week there will be people remembering your request, those people in prayer. Today I want to remember Ruby Russell, especially who has some uh, health issues, and Connie Bishop, who is in excruciating pain at this time, today, now. And also the family of Bill Brogan. Bill went on to be with the Lord. We say he passed away. Well, he went wherever God has in store for him. And uh, Judy and the family, of course, uh, need our prayers for comfort. But he was in serious, serious uh, physical uh, condition that was in pain, misery. So he's been delivered from all that. Uh, his service will be here Tuesday in the sanctuary at 11 a.m. So let us join together, if you would, in prayer. God, thank you. Uh, you've shown us over and over again that you are faithful. Uh, prayers are not always answered in our time frame, but you have the perfect time frame. So in our waiting and anxiously looking forward to May your spirit give us comfort. We do pray today for Ruby Russell to be delivered and healed, for Connie Bishop to be delivered from the pain and healed, and for the family of Bill Broughton, that you will bless them in their time of mourning and grief. And Lord, I'm sure there are some folks here gathered today, some who are in physical pain or emotional pain. And if that is you, if you'll offer yourself, submit yourself to the Lord Jesus even now, we will all pray that God heals and delivers you in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, for the fact that we can worship here freely. We thank you for the musicians who play, for all who volunteer and participate in the total worship service, that we may be a, a, a sweet, Savor a sweet smell to you. And that as you look upon us here, you'll smile and say, These are my children, and I love them so. So God bless our troops here in America today. Thank you for the free land. We never ever take it for granted. And we give you praise and thanksgiving. We do all this and pray in Jesus' name. Join me now in praying prayer that Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, power, Glory forever and ever. Amen. My scripture this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their home towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth and Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. It sounds like exposition. It sounds like uh, if you ever seen Star Wars, the beginning of the movie that has the like the yellow words that scroll that give you all the background information so you know what you're getting into, that's what this reads like. It reads like the background information so you know what you're getting yourself into when you start off this Gospel of Luke thing. 
But uh, there are, you know, as, as usual in Scripture, what, what we need to do is kind of extricate ourselves from our, our 2014 mindset and try and enter into uh, a first century Israelite who's reading this for the first time. And they would hear things a little differently. They would hear things like, uh, like Bethlehem, the city of David. And that sounds kind of nice, because King David is you know, the height of the Israel uh, nation's power and the glory when they're cooperating with God. You'd think of it, but, but Israelites would hear Bethlehem as a backwater, one-horse town outside of Jerusalem. Uh, a bunch of hicks. A bunch of know-nothings. One, one stoplight town where nothing important ever happens. You know, it's funny because we read, uh, when we lit the candle, we read from Micah, which explicitly says, in Bethlehem, I will do something. Righteousness will spring forth from the branch of David, which we read last week. So God kind of calls his shot. And then people are surprised and astonished and it almost goes unnoticed when it happens. And there's this weird thing, because if you were an Israelite, you were probably taught that the Messiah will come in grand glory, will be a revolutionary king, who will finally kick Rome, our oppressors, out of Jerusalem, and we will be back in power again. He will probably be born to someone important. He will be of an important house, an important family. He will have power. He will have followers. He will come in glory with a sword of fire. And yet he comes humbly to a backwater town, to a nobody family. And he spends his first night on earth in a feeding trough because there's no room for him. God's ways in Scripture, it says, are higher than ours. And I believe that's true. But I often read that as God's ways are alien to us. They are confounding. They are absurd. They are irrational. They are insane. God has this way of coming in in and angles and directions and places that are unexpected, that are surprising and confounding. And it's because we, as much as we'd like to think different, don't really know what right and wrong and good and bad are. And we find ourselves dependent upon a God who is confounding and surprising to teach us and show us and direct us. Uh, the candle of Bethlehem is also associated with peace, typically, traditionally, in, in the church. And peace is, in at least scriptural, Hebraic peace, it's, it's not a passive thing. It's not calmness. It's not the absence of uh, you know, turbulence or violence. Peace is this active force that overcomes injustice that overcomes death and destruction and war and violence. And it's ironic because if, if you, you know, any student of history, human, humanity's way is often to accomplish peace by conquering, by military victory, usually. You think about Charlemagne, uh, historically, who brought peace to the, the whole, the known world, which was a very small part of the world at that time, but he brought peace to the known world by conquering it. Alexander the Great, he brought peace to the known world by conquering and submitting them. And this is kind of the human way, and we do this in our own personal lives. In order to find peace, in order to find forgiveness, or healing, or righteousness, or goodness, or whatever word you want to put on that, that squishy good thing, we find it by accomplishing, by conquering, by overcoming, by overcoming our addictions, by overcoming our insecurities. And, and this is our tendency, this is human nature, but God's ways are foreign to us. And they're higher than our own. You see, when we want to bring peace through the sword, God brings peace and deliverance and redemption through the cross. And when we expect a king to come in glory, what we get is a little baby in a field. 
eating trough who was born to die. God's ways are confounding. This morning, I want to share with you a story that I think illustrates this. Because if you're anything like me, I had a hard time connecting with this idea that, that God actually wants me to turn the other cheek, to love my enemy, and to submit and respect and treat the people who are evil against me and against goodness in this world with, with love. Those ideas are absurd. And I, and I had a hard time believing that that was even possible, that victory or redemption and goodness and justice and peace could even come through that. And then I heard this story. It's the best kind of story because it's a true story. The year was 1983. And in 1983, country music was beginning to make a comeback. And a man by the name of Daryl Davis uh, joined a country band because he was a gigging musician and when you're a professional musician, you don't get to play what you want, you play what's popular. And so he joined a country band and he was the only black guy in the band. And in many of the places they played, he was oftentimes the only black person in the entire club. And in Maryland, at a, there's a truck stop, and in that truck stop, there's a motel. And at the bottom of that motel, there's a, a little place called the Silver Dollar Lounge. And that place, in 1983, was whites only. Black people did not go to that club. And so Daryl finished his set. He was a very good piano player, and he crossed the bandstand to join his bandmates. And when he went to go sit down, he felt uh, a hand on his shoulder. And he turned around to see who it was, and it was one of the patrons of the bar. And he was saying, I really love y'all's music. You guys are amazing. And then he said to Daryl, I'll tell you what, I ain't never heard no black fella play the piano like Jerry Lee Lewis before. And naively and innocently, Daryl said, well, that's funny because you know where Jerry Lee Lewis learned to play piano like that, don't you? And he said, what are you talking about? He says, well, he learned it from listening to and studying black blues and boogie-woogie piano. And he says, no, 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 that's, that's not true. Jerry Lee Lewis invented that style of music. And Daryl said, listen, I've known Jerry Lee Lewis since I was 13 years old. He's a personal friend of mine, and he has explicitly told me that that's where he got his style from. And the guy said, no, 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 you're refusing. And they kind of went back and forth, but it was, it was jovial and it was friendly. And he, eventually he says, oh, Daryl, I'd like to buy you a drink. And Daryl wasn't a drinker, but he did agree to, to have a, a glass of cranberry juice, and he joined him at, at, the, at his table, at his friend's table. And they were carrying on and laughing and having a good time all night. And eventually this guy kind of speaks up again, and he says, I'll tell you what, I ain't never had no drink with no black fella before. And Daryl said, well, this is certainly a night of first for you, isn't it? And I said, why is that? And the guy kind of hung his head. He looked at the table and shook it. His friend elbowed him in the ribs and he said, come on, tell him, tell him. And he looked up at Daryl and he said, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Daryl laughed. <laughs> Daryl didn't believe him. He thought he was giving him a hard time because of the Jerry Lee Lewis thing. And so the man insisted and he pulled out a card and he handed it to Daryl and he looked at it. And there was on the card a, a white robed man on a horseback. And on the other side there was a white cross with a, a red circle around it and a red dot in the middle. It's called the, the blood dot emblem. And Daryl recognized those symbols and his laughter faded away and the tone got a lot more serious. The man said, I want you to keep that card, and next time you're in town, give me a call. I want to bring my friends to come hear your band play. So Daryl, they were on a six-week rotation. They were on six weeks to really think about where this guy was coming from, if he was sincere, if he was genuine, if this was a trap, if there was something, some shoe that was going to drop. And so eventually, after a, a long time of really considering what was going on, he decided he was going to give this guy a call. So about Wednesday or Thursday, he gave him a call. And he said, hey, we're going to be playing at the Silver Dollar Lounge this weekend. Uh, you know, he told me to come and let you know when we're coming. So here, here you go. You're invited to come. And true to his word, he brought his friends, who were all clan members, to come hear this black pianist play like Jerry Lee Lewis. And some were more polite than others. Some were engaging and shook his hand and met him and introduced themselves. And some stood off to the side and and were a little more put off by the idea. But nothing violent or terrible happened. Uh, 
uh, they all just kind of danced and enjoyed the music and carried on, and this became a regular thing. For the entire year of 1983, every six weeks, Daryl would call this guy, let him know they were playing at the Silver Dollar Lounge, and he would bring his friends. Well, the end of 1983 came, and Daryl decided that he wanted to uh, take up other styles of music. He wanted to get back to rock and roll and blues, and so he quit that band and went on to other gigs. And he kind of lost contact with this, for this, uh, this friend of his. But because of that experience, you know, Daryl was a professional musician, but his passion was in racial relationships and racism. And he began to study. He began to gather as much material as he could on the Nazi party, on uh, white supremacists, on black supremacists, on uh, anti-Semitism, on uh, neo-Nazism, and, and he researched and researched, and, and eventually, in trying to, to work this out, he, he came to this place where he just could not fathom the idea that someone who's never met him could hate him and wish him harm based on nothing other than his skin tone. And in trying to wrestle with this idea, he, he realized that the best way to, to come to grips with it in himself was to help other people come to grips with it. So he decided that he was going to write a book. So he set out to write this book, and as he was deciding where he was going to start, he, he remembered his, his relationship with this this guy who was a member of the Klan, and he decided that the Ku Klux Klan was the best place to start. So he uh, decided to look up his friend. And when he looked him up, he couldn't find his phone number. All he found was an address. And so he showed up one night in this guy's apartment, un unannounced, and he knocked on the door. And when he answered, he recognized him. He said, Daryl! He stepped out of the hallway, and he looked down one side or the other, See if he was with anybody or if anybody saw him come. And when he stepped out, Daryl stepped in. And he said, well, you know, Daryl, what brings you here? You know, are you still playing? He said, yeah, yeah, I'm still playing piano. Are you still in the clan? And he said, oh, no, I told him some story about it. And they said, well, do you have, you know, any of your robes or your hood or anything like that? And he said, no, it turns out that uh, he had failed to pay his dues on his robes. And they had come and repossessed his robes and kicked him out. <laughs> And so Daryl said, do you know a man by the name of Roger Kelly? He said, yeah, yeah, I know Roger Kelly. Roger Kelly was the Grand Wizard for the Ku Klux Klan of the state of Maryland. Grand Wizard just fits their hierarchy, it's the terminology for their state leader. And he says, I need you to put me in touch with him. No, no, I can't do that. He says, come on, you're not, you're not in the Klan anymore, what are they going to do? He says, Daryl, you don't understand, these are serious people. It's dangerous. And Daryl continued, and he pressed, and he asked, and he begged, and eventually uh, he handed over Roger Kelly's phone number and home address <laughs> under two, with two things to say. He said, first, do not tell Roger Kelly where you got this information. And second, do not visit Roger Kelly at home. He will kill you. So Daryl left with his uh, information, and uh, wanting to set up an interview, he, he employed his band's booking secretary, uh, a lady by the name of Mary. And he told Mary, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to call and uh, let Roger Kelly know that uh, I'm writing a book. Uh, I'd like his side of the story about the, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, but do not volunteer that I'm black. And don't, don't lie to him if he asks, but do not give him reason to ask. So Mary calls and asks him if he's open to the interview, and sure enough, he agrees to the interview. So they set up a meeting for the motel, a motel room above the Silver Dollar Lounge for 5.15 on Sunday afternoon. And they get there early, and, and Daryl has time to sit and think about what's going to happen when Roger Kelly sees that he's being interviewed by a black author. And he thinks, is he going to be violent? Is he going to walk away? Or will he continue with the interview? Right about that time, there's a knock on the door. Mary goes and answers, and in walks Roger Kelly and his Nighthawk. Nighthawk is a Ku Klux Klan terminology for a bodyguard. Man in full uh, camouflage, camp combat boots, and a sidearm on his waist. And there's Daryl and Mary armed with nothing but a bucket of ice and soda. And when he steps in the room, 
both he and Roger Kelly startle when they see that Daryl's black. And before they can react, he stands up, he walks across the room, and he extends his hand. And he says, Mr. Kelly, my name's Daryl. Why don't you come in and have a seat? And he shakes his hand. Before he sits down, Roger Kelly says, do you have some kind of identification? He says, oh, yeah, sure. He pulls out his driver's license and hands it to him. And Mr. Kelly reads his driver's license, and he says, oh, Daryl, you live at... And then announces his address out loud. And if you're a black man in the 80s, the last thing you want to hear is the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan announcing that he now knows where you sleep. And it was unnerving. And it was scary. But not wishing to betray his unnervedness, not wishing to give ground in this initial interaction, Daryl said, well, yes, I do, Mr. Kelly. And you live at, and then announce his address right back at him. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the interview. And he invited him in, and they both sat down and began the interview. And, and it went in a generally respectful tone, with the occasional table pounding for emphasis on points. But every once in a while, uh, Roger Kelly would ask, uh, you know, would say something along the lines of, well, in the Bible it says, and then Daryl would reach down and grab his Bible and say, would you kindly show me where? And every once in a while, the tape would run out, and Daryl would reach down and pull out his tape and, and change the cassette, or the batteries would need to be changed. He would reach down. Every time he reached down into his bag, the Nighthawk, at attention, standing there, would raise his hand to his pistol holster. So it's a little tense. There's a little bit of tension in the room. And at a particularly tense time in the conversation, when Daryl was making an emphatic point, there was a sudden, sharp, loud, <laughs> and Daryl shot up from his chair, and he put both hands on the table. He was startled, and his heart was racing, and his mind was racing, and all he could hear in the back of his head was, Roger Kelly will kill you. And he's thinking, do I have to fight for my life now? Am I have to tackle this armed escort and get us both out of here, him and Mary? And as he's staring Roger Kelly in the eye and with a look that says, what was that? What's going on? He sees the same look being shot back at him. What was that? What's going on? What have you done? And the Nighthawk's got his hand on his pistol and he's looking at both of them. Well, what's going on? What's going on? And suddenly in this tense moment of silence, the sound repeats itself. <laughs> And all eyes in the room turn to the bucket of ice and soda sitting underneath the, table, the uh, window. The ice has melted and the soda was shifting. <laughs> and they all laughed at their fear, at their ignorance. And from that moment on, the interview was a lot less tense. In fact, the interview went so well that at the end of it, Roger Kelly pulled out his clan card and gave it to Daryl and said, stay in touch. Daryl, on his drive home with Mary, couldn't help but wonder what he had gotten himself into. He didn't come to be friends with the Ku Klux Klan. He came to do research. But as he was talking to it, he said to Mary, you know, it's a shame because I actually like Roger Kelly, the man. I don't like what he stands for. In fact, I hate it. But aside from our differences on race, we actually agree on more than we disagree on. He said, we both want to get drugs off the street. We both want a better education for our children. We both want a fair pay for honest, hard work. We both want good things for our people. <laughs> so the next time Daryl was in town, he gave Roger Kelly a call. And he said, my band's playing at this, this place. You know, you're welcome to come. And Roger Kelly, with the Nighthawk, came. He heard it play. And he started this... A constant, every time he was in town, inviting him out, and, and every time Roger Kelly came. And eventually, over the years, Daryl started inviting him to his house. And when he invited him to his house, he also invited uh, a Jewish and Hispanic and all, every minority friend he could find, so that Roger Kelly would know that Daryl was not the exception to the rule. And he came. And eventually, he started coming without the Nighthawk. And eventually, Roger Kelly started inviting Daryl Davis to his house. And over the years, Roger Kelly was promoted from the Grand Wizard to the Imperial Wizard, which is the national leader of the Ku Klux Klan. 
and he started inviting Daryl Davis to clan rallies. So you can imagine this. Daryl went. You can imagine this. The grand, the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan holding a clan rally with his honored guest, his black friend. It caught some attention of local news, and then it caught the attention of national news. In fact, uh, we've got a recording from a uh, news broadcast, and then you'll get a chance to hear uh, Daryl Davis' own words uh, as soon as it's done. So take a listen. Welcome to this final hour of CNN Sunday Morning Friendship. Can transcend all kinds of problems. Just look at us. And two men in the Washington area are showing that even an African American man and a member of the Ku Klux Klan can find common ground. Seen as Carl Rochelle reports. Davis is one of the few African Americans you will ever find attending a KKK rally. More than attending, he is welcome. I got more respect for that black man than I do you white people. We get to know one another, we do different things, you know. It hasn't changed my views about the Klan, you know, because my views on the Klan has been pretty much cemented in my mind for years. And I believe in separation of the races. I believe that's in the best interest of all races. I'm a tolerant man to hell, man, because I believe in what he stands for, he believes what I stand for. Five times we don't agree with everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me. And I respect him to sit down and listen to him. The strange relationship of a KKK wizard and his black buddy. Washington, I'm Carl Rochelle. When you have an adversary, an opponent with an opposing point of view, give that person a platform, regardless of how extreme it may be. And believe me, I've heard some things so extreme at these rallies, they'll cut you to the bone. If you agree with them, great, no problem. If you don't agree with them, that's fine too. You challenge them, but you don't challenge them rudely or violently. You do it politely and intelligently. And when you do things that way, chances are they will reciprocate and give you a platform. So he and I will sit down and listen to one another. Over a period of time, that cement that he talked about that held his ideas together began to get cracks in it. And then it began to crumble. And then it fell apart. During one of Roger Kelly's visits, <coughs> he, uh, he brought a box of packets to Daryl. And Daryl said, well, what's this? He said, open it. And he untied it and opened up the package. He saw in there the robes of the Imperial Wizard of the KKK. Roger Kelly had a change in heart. He had left the clan. And he was giving his robes to his friend, Daryl. Through that friendship, Daryl became friends with two other uh, Maryland State Ku Klux Klan leaders. A man by the name of Robert White and a man by the name of um, Chester Doles. And in the course of their friendship, both of those men came to give their robes to Daryl. Daryl got a lot of criticism. He got called a lot of nasty names. He was called Uncle Tom. He was called an Oreo. He was chewed up one side and down the other by the NAACP. He said, we worked so hard to get one step forward and now you're sitting with our enemies and taking us 20 steps back. And to win that argument, all Daryl had to do was point to his closet. Where hung the end of the Ku Klux Klan in the state of Maryland. Because of his efforts, there is no longer an active chapter in that state. <clears throat> Unless you think that Daryl Davis' story is the exception to the rule, I'll invite you to sit him at the same table as Martin Luther King Jr., who accomplished amazingly great things through nonviolence. To sit him at the same table as Gandhi, who took on the British Empire for the nation of India using nonviolence. And to sit him at the same table as Jesus our Christ, who defeated sin and death without lifting a finger, who surrendered and submitted to his torturers, who loved and respected his enemies to the point of death, but whose eye was so clearly on the end, so clearly on the prize, that he knew his victory would be guaranteed by his father. This morning is communion Sunday. It is our human tendency to want to fight, 
We choose the tree of knowledge of good and evil so that we can know what's right and wrong, that we can accomplish our own righteousness, our own salvation, so that we can be masters of our own destiny. But the problem with that is that we cannot overcome our addictions. We cannot overcome our desperate insecurities. We cannot overcome the wounds that have been left by our past. We, under our own efforts, are hopelessly lost to that. But God's ways, which are in fact higher than ours, God's ways are to surrender. God's ways are to love and respect, even when you are not being loved and respected. So as we come to the table this morning and receive the Eucharist, I invite you to come with your hands open as a sign that we do not take, we do not accomplish our own salvation, but instead we are the recipients of a grace that comes humbly, that comes to die, that comes to lead us to our own cross where we may surrender and find healing and salvation. I hope that you will come with a heart ready to receive The old song goes, I once was lost, but now I'm found. And I believe that most of you are found today. Isn't it great that you're found? You don't have to worry. You don't have to wither in fear about the future, about death. It's all taken care of. So as we commune today, let's do it in a spirit of celebration and thanksgiving for Jesus Christ. After all, he is what all the lights, tinsel, cel uh, celebratory cards, and uh, what it's all about. And I want to extend the invitation to any of you who may not be a member of this parish or this church, that you are cordially invited to receive the sacrament. We only ask that you come uh, at the invitation of, do you love God? Do you love his son? And if you do, you're able to love others. That's the key. That's the key. Not how good you are, how bad you are, because no one, not one of us here is worthy or good enough to receive the sacrament of Jesus Christ. But God makes us worthy. He is our worthiness. And his spirit affords us that pleasure and that gift. So you come, come with a, a heart to love all, to love others. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, sat around the table with his disciples, and he took bread, something like this, and he broke it, and he asked God to bless it, as was their custom. And then he passed the bread around the table to each one of the disciples, and he said something very strange. He said, this, this is my body, which is broken for you. He was referring to the fact that he was going to be destroyed. His body was going to be destroyed on the cross and prior to the cross. And he said, it's broken for you. So in the future, as you eat this, do this in remembrance me of me. Remember me. Remember what I told you. And do it in and that attitude of thanksgiving and love. This is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He then took the chalice of wine and he passed it around to each one of them. Said something else very strange. He said, this is my own blood shed for your sins and the sins of the whole world. Drink this. As often as you drink this, remember me and be thankful. For this then is the blood of Jesus Christ in which we have forgiveness for our sins. Let us pray. God, we pray that you will bless these creatures of bread and wine. Let them truly become for us the body and blood of your Son. And that as we in faith receive Jesus in this way, we'll have our ears, our spirits, our minds open to your will for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
when you come, we invite you to come down the outside aisles and then return to your seats through the middle aisles. Uh, we will have hand sanitizer on either side uh, for those of you who would like to uh, use that. If you have dietary restrictions, we will have gluten-free bread available in brass trays uh, down here in the center. And uh, if you would like to receive communion in your seats, you simply need to raise your hand and if you can't make your way to the front and uh, someone will come and give you the elements and serve you there in your seats. The chancel is open if you would like to kneel and pray. You're welcome to approach the communion table with the cross. Uh, and John, Kathy, and I will be available for anyone who would like to pray. Will our worship support please come forward? Thank you. 
our uh, worship support team is going to pass out our registration pads. So if you're a first-time guest with us and you'd like to register your visit, uh, please fill out the Greek side to let us know that, uh, the best way to get in touch with you. And if you've been here before, write your name on the white side. And uh, particularly uh, during Christmas, if you are searching, if you're having a hard time finding peace, if you're having a hard time addressing uh, the dark places, this is, this is a place where we do that together. So this is a good place for you to write that down. Um, me and Kathy and John and uh, some of our Stephen ministers would be happy to walk with you through that. And to offer any help or any prayer, any support that we can. So if that's your situation, please uh, don't don't miss the opportunity to uh, to receive some help. So take some time to do that.
before we move today, if you have any extra blood you'd like to drop off to help somebody else, the blood mobiles out there. And I say that in all seriousness, but you know, have a drink of uh, juice or something before you do that. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is one of the great ministries here is the Angel Tree Ministry. And we've just adopted two more families, two more. And we need some folks to grab some of those off the Angel Tree out there and to give your support. No better time than in this season that we thank God for sending Jesus Christ. It's his birthday. And we're happy about it. If you'd like to take someone's hand, if you're happy about that, do that. This is a sign of unity in the spirit of love, the spirit of God. My prayer for you is that you leave here today feeling much, much better than you came. Your attitude is better. Your, your, your ability to take on the negativism that you have to face in this world, maybe even this week, on the job, at home, neighborhood, whatever. So God bless all these, my sisters and brothers, your children. They might have a great week. They'll not forget that you love them more than they'll ever know, more than we can comprehend. And that love is able to carry us through anything in this life for His name is Jesus Christ who gave us His Spirit. And now let us leave this place full of peace, free of guilt, ready to enjoy life to the fullest. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen and Amen.